Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Elixir Mix. This week on our panel, we have Josh Adams. Yo. Mark Erickson. Hey, friends. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv, and this week we have a special guest, and that's Zach Kesson. Hi. Now, we have you on JavaScript Jabber, I think, a couple of times. Yep. Um, but do you want to just introduce yourself real quick? Sure. So I've been hanging out in the Erlang Elixir space for a bunch of years. I wrote the book, Building Web Applications with Erlang. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, but I warn you, it's totally out of date. I probably wouldn't bother. <laughs> um, There's and, the hard sell right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's the hard sell. Um, it's, um, it was written in you know, the Erlang R14, R15 days. So I always appreciate uh, reverse marketing, like reverse <laughs> psychology. Uh, you know, if you want stuff, I got stuff that you can, you know, check out. Uh, currently, I'm hosting a YouTube channel called The Beam Channel, uh, oh, nice. which is lots of Erlang and Elixir. Uh, it's excellent. Glad you would like it. Uh, I recorded like five more videos today. I just finished editing the one on Parallel Map. Um, and I've got one on a couple Erlang specific ones. I've got one on EEPs, um, some other stuff. I also have one on um, a bunch more that I've uploaded but haven't released yet, um, including one on context-free grammars and all sorts of other cool stuff. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. Well, our topic today is types in Erlang and Elixir. And type seemed pretty straightforward to me, just, 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 just saying, you know. Um, also, the, the Ruby slash JavaScript developer in me kind of goes types, ew. But, but I'm curious, you know, what, what context do we go to when we're talking about types and why do they matter? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think we have to be a little specific as to what we mean. Because if you talk to, say, a Haskell developer or an Elm developer or even worse, an Idris developer, they're going to mean something very different for types than what uh, we're talking about in Erlang and Elixir. Um, so, you know, we, every language has types at some point. You know, you, you have data, it's got to be represented somehow. So in Erlang, we have a couple interesting things about types. So first of all, they're all comparable. You know, you can say, a, process, a PID is greater or less than an atom, and it will give you a consistent result, which may not make much sense, but you can do it. They're also all pretty much, um, you can convert them all to a, a, a binary representation, <laughs> excuse me, with term to binary. So that's pretty interesting. But on top of that, you know, we have some tools, we have Dialyzer, which does some, which is great. Um, it's error messages are even becoming almost useful. Uh, dialyzers error messages for a long time were generally correct, but also generally um, hard to understand. Uh, I got used to Elm's error messages, which are amazing. Like Elm has the best error messages. Um, I remember some com some conversation podcast where it was an Elm person and a po and a pure script person, and the pure script person's like. I don't like 90% of L, but I got the best error messages. But I kind of, you know, sort of thinking about it. So the way I look at it, you can sort of do a couple things with types. You can do things like tuple types or use records or structs in, in Elixir. 
where you're basically, you're just taking a tuple or a, um, a map and sort of sticking an atom in the appropriate field to sort of tell everybody what it is and pattern match on it. And that's great because then you can, um, you know, your dialyzer can catch your bugs. And also the fact if you have, you know, if you have a, you know, a, a, a a UUID or an integer that's an ID of something and you stick it in a log file, people are like, okay, what does this mean? But if you know, you have the tuple user ID comma GUID, you know, you can sort of say, okay, clearly that, you know, you don't have to guess what it is. Um, also, if you pattern match on it, you can and try to pass a user ID to a function that wants a store ID or something. It'll just bad match error on you. And hopefully dialyzer will tell you about it. But I sort of got thinking, it's like, if you look at proper on Erlang, the Elixir versions don't do this. It can use the types in your file to actually generate test cases. And you know, people have debated on and off through the years how useful that actually is. I'm not going to wade into that one. Um, but I was thinking, like, what else can we do with this? So on the Erlang side, uh, Loic, who created Cowboy, there, did a project, I think it was some of his, like, some summer code students or something called Sheriff years ago, where they actually used types to validate, um, to get the, to validate, you know, inputs to a function so you can actually test things. You know, and say, okay, you know, this, this atom can, this input can be the atoms red, green, or blue, or even more complex types. And it would do that. The problem with this is it was, I think, a summer of code project or something of that nature, and it hasn't been touched in seven years. So it's kind of like, okay, well, it's an interesting concept, but since no one's used it in seven years, or no one's at least applied it, you know, a commit to it in seven years, I wouldn't exactly want to use it. So I went look, I, um, so first of all, there's, um, I put in the doc, Google doc, uh, to a talk I did at Amsterdam, the uh, code beam light Amsterdam a couple months ago, where I went through and I said, well, what, you know, what else can we, can we actually get the type information from a running Erlang module? And it turns out you can, but the documentation on how to do it is completely buried. It's like not easy to find. So I'm curious. Uh, I did watch your presentation on that, and I'm just like, where do you see that being something that I, that can benefit me? That I can get like uh, the type information from a running system. How would you see that being applied? So I have a couple ideas, none of which I've actually implemented yet. So this is more just me spitballing. Uh, one of them is. You know, it's a fairly common problem that if, you know, you have data coming into your application through, through the web or through some other interface, or whatever it is, and you need to, first of all, want to maybe want to, if you're using Cowboy or web machine like that, do content negotiation. But you also need to validate that data. You know, not just, okay, it's a JSON or it's an XML, but also, you know, it has these five fields and, yeah, this one is an integer, and this one is one of these seven values, um, et cetera, et cetera. So what if we wrote a library that you said, okay, here's a, a, t a recursive type definition, a type definition, which can be recursive. And, you know, here's the input, and it's, you know, it can be one of four, you know, even in several formats. And it would automatically validate and decode it for you. So, you know, if you, you have your input comes in, and you know it's correct and fits into your type the way you expect it to. And if it's not, you can return whatever the HTTP error code is for a bad type or bad, you know, bad input. Uh, that, that, that was the one thing that came to mind. Sort of other sorts of validation at runtime, uh, creating test cases, all a quick check like proper does is another. Um, I have not written that library yet, by the way. Um, it is something I'm thinking about writing. I just haven't done it. I probably, give me six months, it'll probably happen. 
presumably before the next time I have to give this, to do this as a conference talk, it'll happen. <laughs> conference driven development. Yes. Um, so that will be, you know, so those are some of the things I was thinking of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have dialyzer, which can do validation of code. Mm -hmm. You know, could we do, and this is, I think, this, you know, could we do other things with types to validate our code? And the answer is, um, I don't know, it'd probably make a good PhD dissertation. So over my head, because I'm not doing a PhD anytime ever. <laughs> so uh, you, we have been talking about dialyzer. And I do want to briefly cover what that is. It may be new to some of, uh, some of the audience. So maybe yeah. we just talk briefly about uh, what Dialyzer does and kind of the, the role that it fills in the, in the kind of ecosystem. So would you like to kind of address that? Sure. So Dialyzer is a utility. It was created by Kostas Sigonis, who's a Uppsala University up in Sweden. And he's created also Proper and a whole bunch of other testing tools. Uh, I recommend listening to most things he does because they're usually pretty interesting. And I didn't realize they're both by the same person. That's really cool. Yeah, same team at least. Okay. I, it, him and his, I think it's him and his various PhD students. Nice. Um, and so basically what it does is it goes through and it does what's called success typing. So it's not as accurate. You know, it, it, can't, it can't find everything that say the Elm type checker could find. There are lots of things it can't find, but it advertises that it never has a false positive. So if it's telling you something is wrong, something is wrong. And you can use it with uh, Elixir. There's a plugin, uh, what's it called? Dialixir, I think it is. Um, and that's basically, you just add it to your, your mixed config file and then run mixed dialyzer and the first time you do it it has to go through the entire library standard or language or library and and parse everything so that takes a while and it puts that into a file called a plt file um which stands for persistent lookup table hey aren't we creative with naming um and then it can just re reuse that so it doesn't have to do that every time. But it finds all sorts of things. So for example, if your function, you have a function that returns either okay value or error something, and your map pattern, you're matching it against something that expects something that's different, you know, okay, not okay value, but maybe just value or something like that, it will, find it. And one of the nice things about it is each atom and for that matter, each integer in Erlang is a separate type, also ranges of integers. So you can say that a function, you know, you have a function day of week, you know, it takes the atom Monday and it returns two for the second day of the week. So you can say that that will take the atoms Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, et cetera, mm. and return one dot dot seven. Okay. Yeah. So, you, you know, it, it's not, it takes an atom and returns an integer. It takes this list of atoms and returns one of these seven integers. Um, and it can, in dialyzer, we'll check that so that if you then pass a string to that function that's expecting an atom, you know, you don't have to write a unit test for that. Dialyzer will just find it for you. And it'll, say you violated it. It'll give you some message about contract violations or something. In addition, when you specify a behavior, it uses um, the same syntax to specify a contract between what the implementation is going to do, modules will do. I'm, I mean, do you guys generally put specs and types in your Elixir code? I put them in everything. I do as well. Chuck? Elm, Elm broke me on, on, on typed things. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm still playing with Elixir. I'm not using it for anything in production. So, yeah, no, <laughs> not really. I, I, I never thought I really liked types until I hit Elm. And then I discovered my problem wasn't that I didn't like types. It's just that many languages that I'd use with types had really bad types. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's night and day. Yeah, I've it's seen, like. 
I've seen a lot of bad types, like just like where the, the way the typing is implemented is just awkward. And I'm always having to do something to satisfy the compiler to tell it, no, no, this is okay. This is valid what I'm doing. Yeah. The, yeah. So like, yeah, in, in Elm, when you're doing that, it is like, you're not satisfying the compiler. You're actually just writing correct code and it, it's telling you where you goofed up and dialyzer sometimes can work that way. Like if you, if you type narrowly, it can, it can be, it's certainly not going to have the error messages that Elm has, but it, it can be very helpful. It can be. And this, this is one of the reasons I like things like tuple types, where if you have like a, a user ID or some sort of identifier, instead of just having, you know, the value as a GUI, a string, or as an integer, or whatever it is, you know, put it in a tuple with user ID. And that way, dialyzer can, can say, okay, you know, because the thing is, as far as dialyzer and the runtime is concerned, a GUID is a GUID, a string is a string is a string, right? Um, it doesn't know one string from another, but you know, you, you stick it with a, an atom next to it and then suddenly, you know, it can make that distinction quite, quite cleanly. It's, it's like a, a poor man's ADT or union type. Yes. Um, and you know, one of the people have tried to make stronger type systems for Erlang for years. And it turns out you're, that's really hard for a couple of reasons. First of all, the update thing would probably break it in ways I can't even contemplate. When you say and update, do you mean like a um, code like update? Yeah, hot, code hot upgrades? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the thing is when you write an Elm program, you specify, you, you create a complete specification of the types of the program. You know, the problem is when you write an Erlang or Elixir program, you can't actually do that because I don't know what requirements are going to get hit with me in six months. And if it's got to run continuously, I have to think about that in some way. Mm, that's an interesting consideration. Yeah. Um, the other problem versus say Elm or Haskell is if you have a type, you know, it's like the maybe type in Elm where it's, you know, nothing or just X, you can't reuse the, the term, the, the, t the type constructor nothing in another type. Whereas you can reuse atoms in Erlang and Elixir any way you want, right? People have done this. There are a bunch of academic papers. I have a, I'll see if I can find the printout of one of them tomorrow and drop it in the, sh in the document. I, I don't know where it is right now. Not the actual printout, the PDF, obviously, or link to it. But people have been working on this and it turns out you can get 95% of the way there and then you hit a brick wall for that last 5%. But there are a couple other things I wanted to point out. So there's a package called type struct for Elixir. I don't know if other people use it. Um, I put a link in the, the, the Google doc there. And it lets you define the type specs inside of a struct inside the struct. So you don't have to write everything twice. Uh, it doesn't fundamentally let you do anything you couldn't do otherwise. It just does it a little more efficiently. Yeah, um, I, had, I had not used this before, but, and, and so there's a, uh, thank you for kind of sharing this and we will have a link to this in the show notes, but it is a uh, typed struct. And I, I, what I think is helpful about this is they give just on the readme of the, the GitHub page, they have a lot of kind of examples of like, you know, this is all of the information that you have to put in when you're defining a struct, like in a, a normal, like, uh, Elixir, if I'm defining a struct, and I want to say these keys are required or enforced, and then I want to be able to define the types to say, oh, well, this person struct has a name, and the name is a string. And so you, it is, uh, I, in some ways, it is a little bit clunky with the way you do it with Elixir, just straightforward. And right. the type struct approach is kind of trying to bring it a little bit more, where it looks a little bit more like, um, like a schema, an ecto schema. Weird. Yeah, I think that's what they were going for. Um, and, you know, it's, it's pretty good. So the other thing that I was working on, and I, I created, a, shared a library, um, a repo here that, of my own. That's, this is not intended for production use. This is just me playing. Uh, feel free to steal code, you know, steal code under MIT license or whatever floats your boat. I don't really care. Um, but if you look at the user default file, um, by the way, if you're using the Erlang, Erlang not Elixir, uh, in the Erlang um, shell, anything you define in a user underscore default automatically gets imported into the shell. 
so you can define a bunch of extra functions that you don't have to you know type module colon function you just hmm. useful tip so if you look at this module here beam types um you'll see that what it does is uh you can type get types it's in user default and then of a, a module and it'll give you the records and the types and all those things and then the specs for any of the functions and even if you have like parameterized types like i have an example here from the gb tree module which is just an erlang module that does general uh, binary trees um, and if you look at the code here you can see that it actually parameterizes um, the those values through throughout so that you can actually get that information of okay this is how this is all structured elixir actually i just discovered this it was digging through everything if you go there's a function in elixir uh code.typespec.fetch types one that returns basically the same thing in not exactly the same format but close enough um it's if you look at if you look at kernel type spec underscore um, kernel type spec beam types is documented, but it's actually deprecated. And then the other one, which is harder to find the documentation on, is not. Um, and if you do it, by the way, you'll see a lot of numbers. Like if you look at GB trees, uh, for example, you'll see, you know, say type one sixty three colon union atom one sixty three colon comma nil, etc. The 163s and 164s or whatever, those are just line numbers. Um, but it basically gives you the abstract syntax tree of the type in some sort of useful way. Um, so you can then play with that. And the interesting thing, as we sort of go off the theoretical deep end here, is I realized as I was playing with this that type specs in Erlang and Elixir actually constitute a context-free grammar. So what are you going to do with that? Uh, parse input data, maybe. I don't know. I'm just, I, I, I've been playing. I, I, I will not contend to, I will not necessarily contend any of this is useful. I'm hoping if I just throw the ideas out there, somebody else will say, oh, that's a good idea. I, I, I have this other, someone else will come up with some other idea that I never would think of. And, you know, if you do that, by the way, uh, please let me know. I'm curious. Um, you know, some grad student out there like listening, come up with a good project. Um, you know, so one of the questions I had is um, you, it sounds like you use Elixir and Erlang. Yes. Uh, it sounds, but I'm kind of curious to like if there's one that you spend more time in and just kind of as a user of both, what are you kind of, how are you, how do you view Elixir from, from that? Uh, so Erlang to I started in Erlang before Elixir was around. Sure. Yeah. Or at least if it was around it was version 0 .0 0 0.0.1 or something. Head. Yes, I mean, it, it was not a thing. Yeah. So um, I started with Erlang. Uh, I got pretty comfortable with Erlang. Then I jumped into Elm and I did a bunch of projects that were Erlang on the back end and Elm on the front end. I kind of had a rule of only one new, new tech per project is sort of my rule. Um, and you know, moving from Ruby to Elixir, I feel you get a huge advantage. Moving from Erlang to Elixir, I think there are advantages, but they're more subtle. I think the main one is that the community and the ecosystem is much more dynamic on the Elixir side than it is on the Erlang side these days. Here, here. This episode is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects. And that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them. And if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs, and this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash elixir. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. 
As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through TripleByte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. Which would I choose for a new project? If it was a library that I thought would be generally useful to the community, I'd probably write it in Erlang so it could be more easily used from both. If it was, you know, a project for a customer, um, I'd say Elixir. I think it's easier to find people. It's easier to hire people. It's easier to use library, you know, the more libraries. I believe that if the current version doesn't do this, a future soon, a future version soon will of rebar will automatically be able to handle Elixir modules. So hopefully in the not too distant future from Erlang, you can simply say, include this Elixir thing and it'll pull it. And yeah, you're going to have to do a few funny things with module names, but there's also an EEP that Jose put out. So Elixir puts the documentation for a module into the module code somehow, but there's not a standard way to, and so does a uh, Lisp flavored Erlang LFE, uh, which I've only played with like on the hello world level, but they don't do it in the same way. So there's a, a proposal out there and hopefully it'll happen sooner or later that all languages on the beam will be able to put docs into the mod, like module docs in, in the same way so that hopefully two, three years from now, you know, which, which beam language you use becomes much more a matter of your team's taste. And, you know, if you're using Erlang and you need a module from Elixir and, and, or, and then you need a module from LFE or something that they'll just all work together. I think that is a goal. I, I do that. like the idea of like when I'm in like a, the REPL in the command line kind of IEX terminal. And if I say like H for help and I can say on some module or, or something that right now I get nothing if I do it on an Erlang module. Right. And, and I, I do love the idea of being able to say, hey, yeah, show me the docs and no, no matter where it came from, it's on the beam. Let me see the docs in my console. Yeah, no, I think this is super helpful to IDE developers as well. Yeah, I mean, also, Indeed. so I, I was very, I remember we had a conversation of mostly Erlang a few years ago before when, when Erlang didn't really have a package management tool. And, you know, my theory, which is what ended up getting adopted, although I don't take any credit, I don't think I deserve any credit for it, was that, you know, Erlang should use Hex, not because Hex is the perfect package manager at some fundamental level, it probably isn't. I don't really know. It's exceptional, but, though. It's good, but it's, you know, the point is it's already there. Right. Um, you know, it's already been started. It's already working. You know, let's not reinvent the wheel if we don't actually have to. Um, you know, I think Elm did a very smart thing in not using NPM, but they had actual reasons for doing that. You know, not using hex simply because, you know, there's some detail in the protocol we don't like. Suck it up and, you know, get over it, folks. Um, you know, I would like to see, but I would like to see, I did a video a while back on, you know, other languages on the beam besides Erlang and Elixir. Let me see if I can find that. Um, and there are actually a bunch of them, and I'm not even counting things that are, like, way out of date. Like, there's a bunch of different lisps on the beam. Um, and some of them are like Joxa, which was uh, Eric Merritt's project. And, you know, last commit was again six years ago. You know, I'm not counting those. But there's uh, a Lua implementation on the beam uh, from Robert Verding. A lot of these get attributed to Robert Verding, by the way. Like yeah. building languages on the beam seems to be his hobby. Yeah, if you're interested in this, he has a a demo that he does with someone else, I've forgotten who, um, where they have little spaceships and each spaceship is running a Lua module and every, and uh, all the coordination is done in normal Erlang. And it's a, it's a fun little project and dense. That sounds really cool. I'd love to find that. Um, oh, here we go. So I did a video back in November. Uh, called there are a lot of languages on the beam um and there actually are a bunch of them um and like i said i i ignored any ones that hadn't been hadn't seen a commit in years 
Uh, my favorite beam language, not that I've used it much or at all recently, sort of the oddball ones is uh, Erlog, which is a prolog on the beam. Uh, but the cool thing is you could take the results of, you know, that type thing I showed you, you know, that comes out of the, no, not the Erlog one, but the Elixir version, uh, pass it in as a set of prolog facts and then use prolog to make inferences over those facts. Uh, I haven't done that yet, but. I played with it and it was neat and I ended up building a rules engine with something else, but I evaluated it. Yeah, I, I did too, actually. I, on building, I have actually on my Trello board of video, YouTube videos to make um, that I haven't made yet. It, one of them is building a rules engine, which was based on one I did a couple years ago for something, somebody. Hey. Real quick, did you, um, when you did your rules engine, did you compile it with hype? I was able to get like a massive, like 80%, 80% speed up on, a, on one I did. I didn't, but it, in this particular case, it didn't really matter. Okay. Uh, what I actually did, the, the, the short version is, um, and this was not designed for speed, was basically, so there's a, if you, oh, what is it? There's a function you can call in module info. Yeah, it's module info that gives you all the functions from a module. So I basically said, you know, any function that has the form rule underscore something and, you know, takes one parameter and that one parameter is some chunk of data um, becomes a rule and it just iterates through them. If it returns true, then that rule, you know, that becomes a possible candidate. If it, cat, if it throws an exception, this was one of those cases where using a try catch in Erlang is actually the right thing to do. They're rare. Um, just go on to the next one. Uh, but that basically meant I could just pattern match on the happy case in the head of each function. It worked pretty well. Uh, I did not try to use that at high scale though. So, you know, your mileage may vary. I got it really, really fast and then uh, was forced to rewrite the engine in Ruby and it was like one thirtieth of the speed I'd gotten, but it turns out it was acceptable for them because they're still using it. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, speed is great, but if, you know, at some level, if you're going faster than the client need, than the needs you need, it doesn't really matter. I will admit I've never actually done Ruby. I went from PHP to JavaScript to Erlang. Seems like an obvious natural progression. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was doing PHP back in the day, and um, I hated PHP. Um, I kind of was to the point of going, if I have to do this language much longer, I'm going to chew my arm off. Because there are some nice bits in PHP, but they're all implemented really stupidly and in ways that make you want to chew your arm off. And I went looking for another, a different language. And I looked at Scala. I looked at Haskell. I'm not quite smart enough to do Haskell, I've decided. I looked at Erlang. I don't think Clojure was quite out yet. That was much of a thing yet then. I looked at a few other languages. And Erlang was the one that sort of checked most of the boxes for me of, yeah, this is actually solving the right kind of problems. That's how I found Erlang. And then I, I had just finished writing a book on HTML5 with O'Reilly and I couldn't quite figure out how to build a web app at Erlang. So I called my editor O'Reilly and said, Hey, what do you say we do an Erlang book? And Simon St. Lawrence went, sure, do it. I mean, there was more emails involved in that, but you get the picture. Um, and that was the origin of building web applications with Erlang. And you know, that was pre cowboy. It was pre web machine really. So it was focused on yours, uh, which was, state of the art at the time, I guess. Um, so, I was going to say, you actually had an influence on me learning Erlang initially. Uh, okay. because I was um, getting into the actor model and I listened to a mostly Erlang about it and just kind of kept listening to him and found out about Brian Hunter and then went, went up to Nashville and, and he basically got me started. Brian's a great guy. I haven't talked to him in far too long. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, I... Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good community. Uh, I like the fact that the Erlang community, or the, the Beam community, I guess we call it now, features an interesting mix of academics and 
practitioners. Like you go to a Haskell conference and it's mostly academics from what I've been told. Uh, you go to a JavaScript conference and I don't think you'll see any academics. In Erlang, it's like mostly us industry types. You have a few people who are professors at universities, mostly in Europe, uh, who are actually doing interesting research and coming up with interesting things like Dialyzer, uh, Wrangler, which was a, a refactoring tool that you know, uh, at Simon Thompson's group at Kent. Uh, Kevin Hammond up at St. Andrews is doing some cool stuff with parallelization that I need to get touch, in touch with him over. Well, and the industry types skew more towards people running larger things. Um, yes. That was one of the, one of the benefits because they were like discussions at early conferences I went to were more about the actual problems I had doing things at scale. One of the things that I like about Erlang and I, don't like about some other languages, not mentioning any names, is that some languages seem to want to reinvent the wheel every six months. And, you know, it's like, oh, so we're going to change our build tool twice a year. And Erlang, I like the fact that the Erlang and the runtime is incredibly conservative. And that, you know, you can write code, pull it out 10 years later, and it'll still work. I would argue that there are trade-offs for that and reasons for that. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, one, you know, you mentioned, you know, the build tool changing um, and JavaScript went through that a whole bunch. Yes. Um, you know, I don't know if that's the language you're thinking of or not. One of them. But, you know, uh, for example, from Grunt to Gulp wasn't really, you know, that big a difference. I mean, it changed the way that it did it internally and it was more efficient and a little bit easier to write, but uh, right. you know, ultimately it didn't change a whole lot. But when, when, we, when things moved to like Webpack or Parcel, um, you know, th that was a major change, and it was driven by the fact that the community had moved on to other things and needed a different tool. And so right. no. it's, it's, it's an interesting conversation to have, right? Um, and I wonder a little bit if what you're talking about is driven by the – by the rate of change in uh, Erlang or Elixir, or if, you know, if that drives the rate of change in Erlang or Elixir, if it's kind of both. I think it's both, because I remember when they were introducing maps into Erlang, which was some years ago, and it took them a couple of years to introduce maps. And I think the first version that had it, which I want to say was 17, but it might have been R16, I don't remember had some weird issues that they were slow if they got too big. Right. Mm -hmm. There was limits on what they could really do. And yeah. Just, and I think it's uh, fun to kind of point out, like if you look at some of the earlier Elixir books, they were using hash dict. So it's, that was the alternative of what you would use. And so it's like, like it really is quite a young thing. And I, I've been very pleased with uh, the Elixir and Erlang communities being able to work together and yes. not, and not be a adversarial kind of relationship. So I've been very pleased that like that, yeah, like things like this come in and improvements are made and, and everyone benefits. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and there's definitely on the, the Erlang OTP core team, a sense of if we put something in the language, it's gonna be there for 20 years. So let's slow mm -hmm. down and get it right. Well, that is a funny thing about Erlang just because they have that long of a, you know, where they have that track record, where they have already had that experience of, yeah, we're still either committed to uh, something that was added a decade ago, you know, and, and like there are other more modern languages uh, where that's not the case, where yeah, well, I mean, more of a, I'm, a, I'm okay to break things all the time. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm assuming it's because Erlang was written to ship telephone switches and I'm assuming, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm thinking it's a pretty good guess. When they ship a telephone switch to a customer, it might be there for 15 years. Yep. Well, the uh, other thing is, is that um, in today's world, my phone is a life-saving device, right? If something happens to somebody, I pick it up and I call for help. And... Um, yeah. You know, and so it had to have that level of reliability too right off the bat. Right. I mean that level of stability in the language leads to the, you know, at least 
depending on how good you are, I guess, at writing software, the same level of stability in, in your software that runs the switch. Right. I mean, and of course, Eric, you know, telephone switches due to contractual and regulatory issues have strong demands in that because, you know, even back in the days of landlines, you know, it's still, as you say, a life-saving device. If, you know, if the phone company takes my city's telephone lines off for, offline for an hour to fix the software, there's a good chance people will die because, you know, they can't call an ambulance or a fire truck or whatever. Um, you know, if you take your game engine offline for half an hour, yeah, you'll probably lose a little money and annoy your customers, but nobody's going to die. So they really have those requirements of, yeah, it's got to be as stable as humanly possible. It leads to some very conservative, I think, engineering choices in the airline, in the airline core. On the other hand, I think Elixir is very interesting in that it can take a very stable core and be faster moving over the top of it and come up with cool ideas. Yeah, that's, that's my favorite thing about the Elixir ecosystem is there's like there's so much rich stuff that's been built around Erlang for forever that uh, like it's easy mining to go find some stuff that maybe hasn't been surfaced recently. And get yeah. Stuff. Like when I was, when I first did WX widget stuff in Elixir, I just, it was, I said, Oh, there's this WX module. And then turns out I can use it and it works pretty much everywhere. And you know, and, and you can also do some cool stuff with reusing things in unexpected ways. Um, like, I did, uh, you know, the recon module, Fred's recon trace module lets you say, okay, how is this function been called? But you can actually use that in a test to say, you know, is a given module and function been called the way I expect it to in your unit test or you're in your check property. That's totally a thing you can do. All right. Well, anything else that we should jump on with types or anything else before we go to picks? I think that's good. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks then. Uh, Mark. Do you have some picks for us? Sure. This is one um, I've mentioned a while ago, but uh, I thought I'd mention it again. It's a, a tool that I use whenever I want to burn a USB that is bootable, and it, it's called etcher.io. So it's E-T-C-H-E-R.io. It's a website, and it's, it's actually an electron-based application, but it's really nice because it has... Uh, it'll list your USB devices, so it doesn't let you accidentally uh, burn in a USB, like a, a, an ISO image to, like, say, your hard drive. So it's, uh, that, it's just a, a nice one. It would be bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's attractive. It's a nice and it's free. So etcher.io is my pick. Nice. Josh, do you have some picks for us? I have one pick and it is Elixir related. It is a 12 minute video from Dave Thomas introducing his components library. Mm -hmm. And uh, I posted a link and it's, it's really fun. If you haven't been following along, this is a sort of a discussion he was having on the forum three months ago, probably. Um, and had kind of hinted at this way of, of building things in Elixir. And uh, it's, it's really nice. It makes it very easy to build lots of small servers that interact um, with nice, just nice macros to, to keep things kind of restricted in a good way. That's cool. I know I've heard him talk about the idea before, but uh, I'm glad to see he's continuing to flesh it out and, and explore that and, and share yeah, what and he's doing. In the demo he builds, I forgot what he builds, but it's a, it's a pretty solid uh, example. And it's, it's really fun seeing how it comes together with his library. Nice. Um, I'm, I'll jump in with a couple of picks. So uh, one of the picks that I have, and this is something that I've been using for a while, but really enjoying, um, and I've found that you can write Elixir in it, is Visual Studio Code. It does have a language service for Elixir. Yeah. I think, I think it's the same one we did the uh, episode on. Uh, yes, that's right. Using it with Vim, you can also use it with uh, Visual Studio Code. Really, really liking that. Um, one other thing that I'm going to pick, and this is this comes out of a conversation that we had on Ruby Rogues today. We were talking about um, Ruby on Jets, which is um, allowing you to build microservices with Ruby. Um, specifically on Lambda, they announced in November that you can do um, AWS Lambda services with Ruby. But they also, at the same time, opened up um, basically a service for you to run it on other systems. 
And so if you wanted to run it on Elixir, you could conceivably build a little shim that would allow you to run AWS Lambda um, on Elixir. So someone has already written uh, up a blog post doing that as well, by the way. Oh, awesome. I'll have to go check that out. But uh, yeah. So anyway, um, I just thought that was interesting and, you know, kind of seeing languages get into more places where you have more options and can do more interesting things. I, I just, I love that stuff. So um, I'll, I'll pick that as well. Uh, Zach, do you have some picks for us? Well, I've got a couple. Um, the first is actually Elixir related. Uh, I put out a email course on how to build releases in Elixir. Um, four part email course using distillery. Uh, if you've not looked at releases for releasing your code, totally should. Topic for another episode, but you guys should talk about that. Um, so that's one. The other one is something that's something that I suspect the rest of you will have not heard of. Um, so you've all probably at least heard of occasionally the Eurovision Song Contest. Uh, it's a big, rather silly European thing that like all the countries of Europe, including Israel, send an act to every year. And so this year it's being hosted in Tel Aviv because Israel won last year. And there's like a talent show on the television here that to, and the winner gets to be the act for Eurovision. And there's a band called the Shalva Band, which has been on it. And Shalva is an Israeli organization that helps kids with disabilities. So this band is, the two lead singers are blind, two of the members have Downs, uh, a couple of the members have other disabilities, and they've just been like running away with it. So I'm gonna send a, a link to them doing uh, the Beatles song, Here Comes the Sun. Uh, they're amazing, totally worth it. Uh, there's some commentary in it in Hebrew, but I'm pretty sure the link has uh, subtitles in English, so you won't miss anything. Awesome. Totally random, but I, I just thought they were really great. So Very cool. If people want to find you online, Zach, where do they go? Um, best way is to go to my YouTube channel, the Beam channel, which I will get you the link to that as well. I also do training courses for Erlang and Elixir developers. So if you want a training course intro to Erlang, intro to Elixir, or using property-based testing in either language. And I've got a few other I'm working, so I'm working on. Give me a shout, happily to bring it to your company. Uh, and, you know, have passport, we'll travel. Awesome. All right, well, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thanks for coming, Zach. No problem. Thank you for having me. So. All right, well, we will be back next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.